Good Hello, afternoon. Home. Thank you all for coming. I think this might have broken our record for JPAC your lunch attendance. So yeah. thank you. We have someone very special here today who happens to be from the area, and we're really lucky to find him. He's located outside of Burlington East Troy area, and I'm sure he'll tell you all about himself. But his name is Larry LaFonsi, and he owns his own character design company, which he will tell you all about as well. And we're doing this in preparation for our upcoming show of Avenue Q that Bowers City Theater is producing. And that upcoming show is the weekend of March 23rd and 24th, and the weekend of March 30th and 31st. And as many of you might know, it's a Broadway musical that uses puppets in the show. And for those of you with kids, it is not for your young children. <laughs> Even though it's Muppets and Puppets, it will not be for your young children. Maybe teenagers will think you're really awesome if you bring them, but not your young children. So it's going to be a great show, and we want to welcome Larry LaFonzi here to bring in our month of puppets, basically. So let's give him a warm welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Sunday night on NBC. It's October 31st, 1938. And tonight, Chase and Sanborn Coffee brings you the Ed DeBergen and Charlie McCarthy Show with the stars, Charlie McCarthy and Mortimer Snurd. And now, here's Ed DeBergen and Charlie McCarthy. Well, Charlie, here we are. Uh, yeah, uh, where are we? Oh, we're at the uh, the JPAC. That's the uh, the Janesville Performing Arts Center. Uh, to Thorning, huh? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, we're going to demonstrate uh, puppetry and ventriloquism today. Uh, I hope you're not going to do that. <laughs> well, of course I am. I'm a world famous ventriloquist. I'm Edgar Bergen. I'm the performer's performer. I'm the ventriloquist ventriloquist. Yeah, you're the cheapskate, cheapskate. <laughs> Excuse me, young man. I thought I gave a very moving performance last week when we were in Las Vegas. The only thing that was moving were your lips. Uh, <laughs> Charlie, Charlie. Now look, you're going to be in a lot of trouble with me today because we've got this very nice audience here and you've got to be polite. You've got to show some respect for people. Young man, do you know how to get people to look up, up to you? Ah, uh, yeah, live on a hill. No, 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 no. <laughs> no Charlie, no. Uh, you know, I can tell. You can? Yes, I can tell that you are going to have nothing but trouble in your future. I am? Yes, you are. Oh, goody. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Bring on the girls. <laughs> oh, 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 speaking of girls. Oh. I don't get you. <laughs> Hey, would you stop, Charlie? You're embarrassing me. All good. That's what I'm supposed to do, you know. Yes. Um, Charlie, that's the executive director of the JPAC. Yeah, well, who cares? Hi! <laughs> Charlie! What? You are going to cause such trouble. Can you stop that right now? You can talk to her after the program. Okay. Oh, my little kumquat. <laughs> my little tangerine. <laughs> I squeeze you later. <laughs> Stop. I can see your future now. What will you be 32 years from now? Uh, 32. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> what will you be when you grow up? A man? No, no. You're going to be nothing but trouble. And I can see your future. Do you know why? Uh, no. Pray tell. Why? Well, because... I'm a soothsayer. A uh, what? A soothsayer. What? Pray tell is a soothsayer. <laughs> and you don't do that very well ventriloquially, do you? No, no, no. <laughs> I can see your lips move, you know. Yes, 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 I, I know. I'm sorry. I'll, I, I'll try to be better. Yeah, would you please? It soils the illusion. Yes. Uh, decide, there's no use in both of us being dummies. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Look, I want to get on with this. I can see your future. It's right out there. I don't see a thing except your finger. Uh, no, no, out there in the stratosphere. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's your future, and I am going to see it for you, and I'm going to predict what's going to happen in your life. You are. Yes, I am. This I gotta see. Okay. Now, in order to do this, I must have absolute quiet. 
Edgar Bergen, the great soothsayer, is now going to go beyond ventriloquism. He's going to go into the great stratosphere. Will you knock it off? And shh, I'm concentrating. And I'm going to need absolute silence. Oh, boy. And now I'm going to go into a trance. A trance? Yes, a trance. What, pray tell of the trance? A trance. Uh, it's a state of, uh, of half-sleep, of semi-consciousness. Well, you got that licked already. Thank you. Your audience is already there. Uh, please. All right. Off into the future now. I'm going to go into my trance. Must concentrate. All right, Charlie. Here I go. Are you sure you're going in from the right end? <laughs> I'll have to start again. I think his trance is too tight. It would stop it. <laughs> I think he sprung a leak. Would you please, Charlie? This is just too much. I don't think you know what you're doing. Yes, I do. In fact, I don't think I know. Yeah, well, I don't think you know either. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie McCarthy. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm not actually Edgar Bergen. That's rather obvious. <laughs> um, Edgar Bergen uh, was of Swedish descent, and he came from the Midwest, in fact, just south of us, Chicago. And uh, he had a, a, a slight Swedish accent, so he talked a lot like this, you see. He had a very strange accent. He sounded as if he was from uh, uh, the East Coast or something. It was affected uh, because he was on vaudeville, and he had to project out to the audience. Yeah, I wish you'd project yourself right out of here. Well, I'm going to take him in the back for just a moment. He keeps wanting to fall off. The other night when I was in my uh, workshop, he was on this very chair, and he did a half gainer and a backflip right off the back and landed right on his head, which is not good for expensive dummies. So one moment, I'm going to just put him in the back. Bergen, do I have to take a nap? Yes, you've got to take a nap. Then just to... shh, quiet. Wouldn't you know he's got a girl back there? Charlie, <laughs> I'll tell you. I don't know about that fella sometimes. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Charlie McCarthy, we're going to be talking about some of the stars of ventriloquism, of puppetry, and we're going to be talking about ventriloquism and puppetry through the ages. We're going to be talking about how it affects our lives in so many ways. These days we see them in films, we see them on television, but believe it or not, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. Here's Charlie and Edgar. They had lots of uh, sponsors. Uh, Coca-Cola, when they moved to CBS, was their big sponsor in the 1950s. And let's go to the next one here. And now, puppetry can be as difficult and as complicated as having something like, say, um, an animatronic puppet that you'll see in the movies these days or on television. They can be, have moving eyes, wiggling ears, hair that flips up, tongues that stick out, spitters, crossing eyes, rolling eyes, the whole thing. But most puppetry for most people starts out as something very simple. Now later on, when we're done with our demonstration today, uh, we'll be having a little Q&A. So you'll get to ask some questions. You'll be able to come up here and take a look at some of the puppets. We'll have a discussion. And there's some things out there to look at. I'd be more than happy to answer some of your questions. Um, meanwhile, <clears throat> you should know a couple of things about me. When you talk to me, I'm extremely deaf. Believe it or not, even though I'm a ventriloquist, this is true. I'm completely deaf in this ear. I'm half deaf in this ear, and today you can kind of hear the honkiness in my voice, and I'm a little raspy. I've got a sinus condition, which means this ear, the good one, so-called, is plugged up. I've got about 10 to 15 percent of my hearing. I may have to read your lips, honestly. And to make things worse, I'm also blind in this eye. Now what's funny about that is I can only see from about here over. After that, I can't see anything. So if by any chance you're coming on my right side, you're going to watch it because I don't want to crash into you because quite often I'll suddenly turn to the right and I'll smack into someone because I don't see you there. I'll do something like, go, go. <laughs> you scared me. Well, hi. 
Who are you? Well, I'm your sock. <laughs> My sock. No, you're not. I've got both of my socks on. No. You know that story about the dryer? The dryer and the washing machine? You know those socks that seem to go missing? <laughs> I'm the one that got away. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. And um, who is this young fellow up here? He looks a little like you. Oh, that's my cousin. He escaped with me. Oh, I see. He doesn't look like you. And what's with the sunglasses? Uh, he's going incognito. He doesn't want the police to catch on. Oh, I see, I see. So why are you here anyway? Well, besides bothering you, uh, I want to tell everybody about how simple puppetry can be. What we have here is a, just a simple sock, one of the few I own that doesn't have a hole in it, and it's actually been laundered. I'm a bachelor. So we put a little rubber band in there, and we've got a mouth. It's the best way to start off. You can do it in your living room, and you can start talking to the grandkids, start talking back to your wife. <laughs> She'll send you off to Shady Hills. <laughs> I'm one of those guys. I'm 55 years old, and I have a house full of dummies. <laughs> I blame the dirty dishes on them, and you can probably guess why I'm a bachelor. <laughs> not the dirty dishes. No. No, because it's he plays with dolls. <laughs> shush, shush. <laughs> so puppetry can be anything as simple as a sock and as big as the building. Have you ever gone to those parades where you see those giant stilt puppets and they've got rods on them? Some of them are as much as two, three stories tall. Uh, I didn't bring the one that I have because uh, he's too big to fit in the truck, but I've got one with a head this big of the giant pig that we used in the People's Parade up in Milwaukee a few years ago. I have to find my clicker. Well, there we go. And uh, at any rate, um, these things can get really big, and you have to make them very lightweight. These wood puppets, like the one I just had out here, Charlie McCarthy, it's kind of on the heavy side. Uh, so anyway, we, uh, we're going to start with something simple, which are the socks. Okay, someone slipped that in there. It wasn't me. It had to be the sock did that, right? It wasn't me. Okay, he's been busy. You can dress up a sock. Put some buttons on it. Put a little bit of hair on it. How many people here remember Senior Wences? Anybody remember Senior Wences? Oh, yeah, a few people out here. For those of you that don't know, believe it or not, Senior Wences lived to be 103 years old. He continued to perform right up until he was 95. And he used to use a character named Johnny. Johnny was a simple hand with a little body. He had a little thing he would hold, and the body would be below it, and the hand would just talk. And he had it on uh, Ed Sullivan quite a bit, and he became very famous just with that. Now I bet you some people here know who this is. How many people know who this little puppet is? Quite a few. All right. And, and I learned this morning that, that uh, we have a Sherry Lewis fan down here and the executive director. <laughs> anyway, now I don't do uh, Sherry Lewis's voices because she's a female and a little difficult to do. But this is, this is Lamb Chop. I've got a version at home that's actually signed by her daughter, which is really kind of neat. And uh, this is nothing more than a glorified sock. That's all it is. It's just a sock with a little felt tongue, some little eyelash things, and a body. And that's how she started. She was the daughter of a, of a relatively famous musician in New York. He taught her ventriloquism, but she was using these big dummies. And Captain Kangaroo asked her to come on the show in the late 1950s, but they said, can you use something a little smaller? The big dummies frighten the kids. So she came up with this. And Lamb Chop, a simple sock, became an icon to an entire nation and the world. Sherry Lewis continued uh, to practice her, her ventriloquism and puppetry skills and entrance the world right up until her death uh, just a few short years ago. I believe she died in 1998. Uh, currently, her daughter is out on the circuit, Mallory Lewis. Up oh, there's Lamb Chop. Now, it's a little hard to see this picture, but that's me with Mallory Lewis, little tiny gal about that big. She's on her tiptoes, and I'm not exactly tall. Uh, very, very nice woman. She, uh, she invited uh, my partner and I to come out to the state fair last year, took us to dinner, 
And uh, we talked puppets, of course. And uh, she's just the sweetest thing. She never took a lesson in her life. And she could do ventriloquism as well as her mother. And I, I'm at dinner going, no, that's impossible. No. You don't move your lips. How? how? How did you do this? Hanging around her mother forever. <laughs> never took a lesson. And so she carries it on, and she does uh, Lamb Chop and uh, Hush Puppy. She's working on Charlie Horse. She goes around the country. In fact, she's been uh, to Germany now, France, and England. Uh, so she's all over the globe uh, bringing uh, Lamb Chop to people. Uh, her mother uh, started uh, that puppet in about 1958, 1957, right around the time I was born. So that's an icon that still lives on, a simple sock. Today we're going to talk about the history of puppets and ventriloquism. Uh, they're sister arts. Ventriloquism is more of a magic art. Uh, puppetry is its sister. They kind of grew up together in different veins. Uh, puppets have been used throughout history uh, to control people, to teach, uh, to get across political messages, religious messages, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, same thing with ventriloquism. Ventriloquism was first used, of all things, in the Bible. The Witch of Endor, it's mentioned at least four if not five times in the Old Testament that the Witch of Endor was using ventriloquism. Uh, the ancient uh, word for that was, I believe, the Aramaic was nob, N-O-B-B. -B. And it was uh, also known as necromancy. The Greeks called it ventriloquism, loose translation, belly speaking. It's a misnomer. Everything happens here, comes out your nose. You're literally nose speaking. Well, the Witch of Endor employed this to scare people. She used it to control them. It's in the Bible. If you look in the Old Testament, you'll find it at least four times that I know of. And then we have to move on into history. Everybody knows about the Salem witch hunts. Excuse me, I'm going to go grab my water here. <coughs> like I said, I'm dealing with a cold, so I, I apologize. Whoops. There goes that. That'll look good on film. Um, Throughout history, because of people like the Witch of Endor and because of uh, people that employed it for devious means, people were scared of the belly talkers, the ventriloquist. Some people employed it as a, a simple at-home entertainment. They talked for their dogs and their cats, which was not a thing, good thing to do during the Salem witch hunts. <laughs> the gentleman over on my left and your right is Matthew Hopkins, known as the Witchfinder General. And Matthew Hopkins would look for people who were talking to their dogs or cats. And he would have them hung, burnt, drawn and quartered, ducked in a pond, ventriloquists, uh, simple people at home in their, in their little huts, playing with their cats and dogs who were accused of being witches and warlocks. And normally what would happen is you would see some little old lady talking to her cat or her dog. And he'd be spying around the corner and go, ha, ah, I know how I can make money with the city. He was paid for this. The witch finder general was paid to go looking for ventriloquist. So at one time, what I do was a bad thing. <laughs> Not safe. And it didn't matter if you were male or female, witches and warlocks. And people went to jail, they died. Uh, that would not be fun, and it's really not good for ventriloquism because if you've got a noose around your neck, it's really hard to use your voice. <laughs> it was also uh, employed at first for nefarious reasons by Cardinal Richelieu. Now, Cardinal Richelieu actually had an order out that no one could do ventriloquism. It was considered a black art. However, he had a man in his employ secretly that would stand in his court and he would use ventriloquism to scare anyone he wanted to control. But the masses couldn't do it. It was a secret art. Along with that, King James I also made it against the law to speak ventriloquism, uh, to do any kind of necromancy or voice throwing. And any book that was on the subject was burned. He was the original book burner. Once the kings and their, and their nefarious people uh, 
got done scaring people. <laughs> Eventually, someone got wise and went, you know, to make kind of a fun entertainment. The courtchesters got a hold of it. And they would use little rod puppets just to stick with a little hat on it. It didn't move a mouth. And they'd wave that around. And they would do ventriloquism. And often, the routines that they would do in court for the kings were politically tinged. And they would use that to brainwash. And they would use it to kind of move ideas, move the court into, a, uh, into whatever direction they wanted to go. And at the same time, keep the king happy because he would make them laugh. And that led on to the Punch and Judy shows. Now, this is where puppetry takes over from ventriloquism. Street performers uh, took a character known as, in Italian as Puncinello or Pulsinello, uh, and in English it became Punch or Punchinello, uh, and his wife, Judy. And they were very grotesque court jester types. He had a long nose and a, and a long chin that came out, and he was a rather ugly fellow that carried a bat with him. And his wife carried a big spoon, and they would beat each other with it. And it was all over political discourse. It was all hidden inside of the comedy. And these uh, puppeteers would go around Europe, whether it was in France, Italy, England. And uh, they would have these little booths like this where they would perform. It's called a proscenium. There's a playboard. Puppeteer is up above the playboard like this. And they would have the Punch and Judy shows. And they traveled from town to town. And people would throw their coins and their money. So they literally worked for chicken scratch. The, uh, the arts of puppetry and ventriloquism, as you know it, uh, didn't really begin to flourish heavily until the uh, 1700s, when traveling ventriloquists were invited to work on stage in England, France, and uh, eventually in the United States. And they were working music halls. And around 1864, 1865, right at the end of the Civil War, someone decided to make a ventriloquist dummy as we know it today. They're sometimes known as knee figures. And the ventriloquist would put his leg up like so and have a figure on, and he would talk to him. And uh, that would eventually transpose itself into uh, vaudeville and music halls in England and they became top-of-the-bill performers. Around the turn of the century, a fellow over in England by the name of Fred Russell uh, came out with a wise guy character known as Coster Joe. He was a cockney fellow like this, you know. He talked with his heavy accent, and he was a wise fellow. He gave him a hard time. And he became very famous. And ventriloquists in the United States had seen his act, and they began to emulate it on the vaudeville stage uh, here in the States. Uh, a couple of the more famous ones, there was uh, the great Lester, uh, right around the turn of the century, uh, century worked with a puppet named uh, Frank Byron Jr. And he could drink a glass of water without moving his lips, make the puppet talk. He could hear it coming out of the telephone. And one night, a fellow in the orchestra pit thought he'd be funny, put a little whiskey in his glass, started drinking. Puppet started coughing. He never moved his lips. <laughs> True story. Um, a little bit of black history. Uh, there was a fellow named Cooper uh, who was a very famous, uh, at the time they would have called him a Negro performer or a black performer. And he worked something called row ventriloquism. And row ventriloquism, you literally have a row of figures sitting on chairs and so forth and uh, on a stage up above the audience. And he had what was called a barbershop scene. And he played the role of a barbershop uh, owner and hair clipper. And he would go from chair to chair clipping hair. One of the characters was a, a little boot black, and he's doing this, the mechanical. And all the other ones, he would just move over, and there were little pedals under the chair. And he would mo move the mouths and the heads with the pedals. And he did this with row ventriloquism. It became a very popular form of entertainment. And that went from the United States back to England. And we were trading off back and forth with all of these styles. Um, his granddaughter still lives in fact, she was just on PBS. Can we say that on, on uh, cable TV? <laughs> Our friends over at the public uh, television station, uh, they, uh, they had a special, uh, one of those history shows, and they dug into the history of, of the Cooper family, and they, they actually talked to his great-granddaughter, and she still has the puppet. And it turns out that that puppet was made by the same guy that made Charlie McCarthy the first time, made by Charles Mack, so they're cousins. <laughs> so. Some of the great influences that came into the uh, 20th century uh, out, of, uh, out of vaudeville 
with a vaudevillian himself, the biggest of all. Most of you here have heard of him. You just saw his puppet out here, and that's Edgar Bergen. Edgar Bergen was born in 1903 in Decatur, Michigan. Ended up being a Chicago native after that. Uh, by the time he was 18 years old, he was already making brooms and uh, dustpans talk in the house and driving his mother crazy. And he could also speak fluent Swedish. So he would drive all of his Swedish relatives nuts. <laughs> and uh, he started out with Charlie McCarthy as a, a ragtag newsboy. So we'll be talking about character a little bit later on. No monocle, no top hat. Uh, just this ragamuffin with a, with a beat up hat and a torn sweater, and he was supposedly a newsboy. He was actually based on a newsboy that was in his neighborhood as he was growing up. His name happened to be Charlie, and the fellow that carved him was Charlie Mack. He became Charlie Mack Arthy. He wanted an Irish puppet. Um, eventually, uh, as vaudeville began to die out and radio began to take over in the late 1920s, early 1930s, Bergen was working in small shorts uh, with the Vitaphone Company. Uh, I forget who they're a division of, but uh, they would do these short 15-minute uh, black and white films that would precede the larger feature film at, at the... Uh, they weren't cineplexes then. <laughs> it was just one movie. And they, they would have a double bill, and that would be on the bill. And uh, nobody recognized him. Nobody knew who he was because vaudeville was dying out. And he knew that his career was in trouble. So... Looking at Esquire magazine and Esky, their, their mascot, he's got a top hat and a monocle. So he patterned his dummy after that. And he was invited to uh, a party at Elsa Maxwell's house in New York. Rudy Valley caught the act. How many people here remember the name Rudy Valley? Some of you do. Rudy Valley was a, a major performer of the 1930s and 1940s, a ventriloquist himself and a singer. He saw the act and put him on the Fleischmann Hour in 1936. And Charlie McCarthy, as we knew him, was born. The smart aleck kid with the uh, penchant for nice clothes. And that's how he began. Edgar Bergen, probably more than any other performer in the 20th century, affected all puppetry. Not just ventriloquism, but all puppetry. Mainly because he was a character man first. His, all of his puppets had fantastic character. You had Charlie, who was just this brash little 12-year-old who, no holds barred, would say anything. You had Mortimer Snurd, who was kind of shy and <laughs> not real bright. And uh, you had Effie Klinker. Some of you may remember her. And she was a man-hungry young lady of about 60. And uh, he had all of these characters with these fantastic personalities, but he also dressed the part. So visually, they looked wonderful. And he had great manipulation skills. They looked absolutely real, which was good, because Edgar Bergen had terrible lip control, like yours truly. Just flapped all over the place. So everybody was watching the puppet. Well, because of his puppetry skills, the puppet world took notice, not just the ventriloquist. And they went, this is how puppetry is supposed to be. We're supposed to make these guys look real. We're supposed to draw you in to our world and make you revel in what we're showing you. No matter, no matter what we're showing you, you're there. You're in the moment with us. He taught the world puppetry. One of his biggest fans, Jim Henson of the Muppets. We'll be talking about him in just a few moments. Uh, some of those stars that, that really learned from Edgar Bergen, I've, I don't know if everybody can see it from there. Here's Edgar Bergen, of course. How many people remember Bill and uh, Cora Baird, the Baird puppets, the marionettes? Some down here do. Uh, they started in the late 1930s. Uh, they continued to work up until, I believe, her death in the late 1970s. And I believe Bill was still working in the 80s when, when he passed away in the late 80s. Um, they were string puppeteers. String puppet, of course, is anything that you have on the end of a string and you make it move, kind of like Congress. <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't say that. But uh, at any rate, they, uh, they had these wonderful uh, string puppets that did everything. Eyes moved, ears flapped. Uh, they could juggle. They could ride unicycles. And they were the first ever to employ an entirely different method of, of showing puppets on film. They preceded Jim Henson in, in the uh, creative department. Most puppeteers that uh, work with marionettes work in a box. And they're way up on what's called a bridge. And they hold the puppets like this. And then there's a curtain that hides them. And then a backstop. And then they manipulate the puppet. Like, uh, let me go grab this real quick. Oop. They manipulate the puppet from way back so you can't see them. There's a wall. 
Okay. Yeah, that's Mickey Mouse. That's actually one of my little collectibles. He's about uh, 1955. He's very old and getting kind of brittle. And we just had to untangle him today. <laughs> the guys that moved me into the new shop weren't paying attention. But at any rate, the, uh, the uh, puppeteers would have them uh, from behind the screen so that you couldn't see them. And there was a screen here covering them, basically performing in a box. Well, what the Bairds did is they developed a system where they were walking on, on what was essentially a moving bridge. They did Peter and the Wolf for television back in the early 50s and they developed all of these trees in the background and in the foreground where you couldn't see the tops of them. They all had platforms on top of them so they're walking from platform to platform like this with their puppets moving them in the foreground as the cameras tracked them. It was the most innovative use of puppetry to that date. And that's where Jim Henson learned a lot of his tricks later on. Oop, there you go. Stay. I have a mouse that does tricks. Let's see how this mouse works. Um, everybody here kind of learned from one another. The Bairds were so popular that Howdy Doody was a shoe in And I'll bet you almost everybody in this room at least knows who Howdy Doody is. How many people know who Howdy Doody is? How many people remember the peanut gallery and the song? It's Howdy Doody time. It's Howdy Doody time. Remember that? I was right at the tail end of that. I still remember it as a little, little boy. Um, Buffalo Bob was the guy that uh, created the image. It was, uh, the puppet was carved by a gal named Belma Dawson who worked for Disney out in California. And uh, they did what's known as Puppet Bridge. And they were up on one of these bridges. And then Buffalo Bob provided the uh, voice for him off camera. Anytime you saw Howdy moving around on stage, they had a close up and you couldn't see Bob. He's off camera doing the talking for him. Everyone thought he was a ventriloquist. Nope, just the voice guy. Someone else ran the puppet. But Howdy Doody was such an icon of puppetry that this was the new explosion of merchandising in the United States. This is how strong a puppet can uh, affect an audience. First, there was Edgar Bergen, and he was a merchandising wizard. Literally hundreds of thousands of Charlie McCarthy related memorabilia. Some of that you will see up here, from comic books to keychains to little toy cars, you name it. He made most of his millions on merchandise. Well, Buffalo Bob was no fool. He followed Bergen's example. And they merchandised to live in you know what, out of Mr. Howdy Doody. And to this day, there are still Howdy Doody collectibles being made, still. Uh, I have a lunchbox at home. It, it's a replica of, of the old one. Uh, they're still making those things. Uh, let's see, I've got my Howdy over here somewhere. Where do we put him, Chris? Oh, way up there. I've got a Howdy Doody here. Uh, he's very ancient. He's fallen apart. And you'll be able to take a close look at him a little bit later on, but I'll ask it. I'm the only one that handles him. Uh, he's getting very brittle. He's about 60 years old now and not faring well. <laughs> Most of the toy puppets that, uh, that they merchandised were made out of a composite material that was literally made out of sawdust and glue in a mold, and then they would paint it with enamel. Well, somebody wasn't using their brain because enamel, humid weather, in a place like Wisconsin, it separates and it begins to crack and it peels off. So, uh, so that's why they're worth so much now because they're really fragile. Um, so now we've got all these famous puppeteers that are coming off of, the, uh, of Edgar Bergen's success. But the next big thing in puppetry was Paul Winchell, Jerry Mahoney, and Knucklehead Smith. And I'll bet you most of the people in the room remember those guys, right? Yeah, remember the Jerry Mahoney Club? Okay, well, that's these guys right down here. He's a New York-born ventriloquist, and he was a very shy man with a stuttering problem. You never would have known it watching him on TV. And he had a very uh, a New York accent. He'd say, Jerry, you should be thoroughly ashamed of yourself. And you can just hear it in his voice. You get that rough New York accent. And Jerry was just, he was a Brooklynese kind of kid. Yeah, oh, you look real good today, wench. And he'd say something smart. One time they got stopped by a, an officer of the law. He was going a little over the speed limit. True story. And of course, back then they didn't have seat belts. And he's holding the dummy in the front seat and driving with one hand. He's driving way too fast around a curve. <laughs> Cop stops him. Puts his hand behind the dummy. The dummy sticks his head out and goes, you think he was going fast now? You should have seen him back down the road. <laughs> he was going like 60. <laughs> got himself talked out of a ticket, but that's a true story. Yeah, he had a great sense of humor. Um, 
Well, Paul Winchell uh, did something brand new that had never been dummy, uh, done with dummies before. He'd set them up against the wall and have a puppeteer come in through sleeves and do live hands. Knucklehead Smith and Jerry Mahoney played the drums. They would play horns. Uh, they would juggle. they played play the tambourine. All sorts of stuff that other dummies couldn't do because mostly the hands are wooden or some sort of plastic, and they don't go anywhere. So he developed that technique. Uh, so he married uh, puppetry with ventriloquism and dummies. And then after that came Jim Henson. Jim Henson took everything that everybody did. He took string puppets, rod puppets, ventriloquist dummies, standard uh, hand puppets, and married them all together. And that's where the name Muppet comes from, marionette, puppet, Muppet. And uh, he and his wife Jane, in 1955, had their very first show on local television uh, in uh, Maryland. And it was called Sam and Friends. And uh, Sam is the little tiny guy way up here in the back, made out of celastic. Uh, it's a very brittle material, and they don't, they don't sell it anymore because of the chemicals in it. It'll turn you into the Mad Hatter real quick, using that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's not good to handle. Um, and that's the original Kermit down there. Kermit the Frog started out as an it. They didn't know what he was. They just called him Kermit. Uh, he didn't have fins. He didn't have his little pointed collar. He was green, and he was made out of his mother's old coat. They had no money, no budget. Kind of like me. So. Anyway, uh, Jim Henson took things uh, completely off the map. He had ideas that nobody had ever entertained before by blending all of these ideas. And he realized the value of puppetry in television. He realized that he was free to move wherever he wanted. Now, you've got some cameras here today. Now, if a camera were to follow my hand and go above my head, why do I need a playboard? I don't. The puppet's up here. So they'd have all these puppeteers working way up here, and you'd have different sized people, and the short ones would wear cork soles to be on the same level as the other people. And the camera, all the cameras had to do was stay above their head. And they could build their sets so that they were open. They'd use panels like this, and they'd have all the scenery up here. Everything below here is blank. And they'd have these puppets way up here, and they could move wherever they wanted. And then they added rods onto the puppets, and they could make them move. Uh, I've got some rod puppets over here I can show you a little bit later. Um, adding rods to the arms, you can gesture. You know, let me bring one out. I'm going to bring out Chico the cabbie for a moment here. We've got a little extra time here because we're going fast on time. So this fella comes in two pieces here. Come here. And I want to point something out real quick here. He's got two entrance holes, one in the back and one in the bottom. There's a reason for that. Through here, he's a ventriloquist figure. Through here, he's a proscenium puppet. So we made him two different ways. Let me put him on real quick here for you, if I want to show you something. And I'm throwing poor Elizabeth the curve here, because I didn't tell her about this one. <laughs> We're going fast on time, so I figure I'll throw an extra one in there. Yeah, it's all good, right? So this here is uh, Chico the caddy. Yo, man, how you doing? Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, toss up. How's your toss He'd get a little arm here so he can gesture. That's a rod, a little, uh, little wooden dowel here. And the rod goes right into his hand. Hey, man, I got a question. What's that? How come I don't hurt, man? Because you're a puppet and you're made out of foam? Oh, man, I don't think my wife is going to like that. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, and here's an example of a Muppetized uh, puppet. This is made out of foam, very spongy. And he's got some uh, special movements in him. Uh, besides his rod, he's got moving eyebrows, moving eyes. I'll show you that in just a sec here. I don't have those switches hooked up, but for the cameras here, he's got the moving eyes. And he's got moving eyebrows. <laughs> like that, and of course, the moving mouth. And it's all operated from the inside. And this particular model, if I can find the switch, we're rebuilding this guy, has moving ears. <laughs> so like I said, you can go from socks to something a lot more complicated. And it's just a bunch of foam glued together with some felt and some other materials. and. You can make a, a, a pretty 
complicated puppet if you like. So Jim Henson opened up the world to puppets like that. Nobody had ever seen things with moving eyes and moving hands and all of these things were happening and he took the world by storm. He started doing commercials for uh, Wilkins uh, shaving blades and then he was doing uh, big commercials for uh, La Choy Chinese food. Anybody here remember the La Choy Chinese dragon? They had this big puppet about the size of the big bird from Sesame Street, and there's a man inside this thing, the costume. He's walking around like this, and you've got a little tiny TV camera inside of it so he can watch himself. But he's got to go backwards because everything he's looking at here is reverse of what he's actually doing. So he has to learn how to think in reverse. <laughs> and this dragon is about seven feet tall, and it's got this huge tail behind it, and he's got this uh, chef's hat on, and he's running through the grocery store. And the guy that's the, the poor guy that's following him, the, the grocery uh, store owner, is watching every time he turns around to answer a question, his tail goes flying and he knocks off all the cans. <laughs> and then he answers a question and fire breathing happens and he burns half the place down, which is kind of, kind of a signature Muppet thing. Well, those commercials, because they had those signature endings like that, uh, got him uh, a big gig on the Jimmy Dean show. Some of you remember Jimmy Dean, uh, where he came up with uh, Ralph the Dog, and some of you remember Ralph. I've got a toy version over here. Now, Ralph was the piano playing dog. You remember him? This is just the toy version of him. Yeah, how you doing? Yeah. And they had a big puppet like that, and he played the piano. And they had uh, a puppeteer on either side. They had to learn how to literally make it look like they were playing piano with three fingers here and a thumb. Had two fingers in the middle and like this. And they had to learn how to play. They literally had to make it look like they were playing, even though the, the piano was dead. But they had to make it literally look, because the camera would always be over their shoulder. And then they had to cut the guys out of the scene so you couldn't see the puppeteers. Really tricky stuff. All brand new to television or any other medium at the time. Well, that became so big, he ended up on the Ed Sullivan Show. And then before you know it, he was on Johnny Carson. And then, he was, uh, then they were on uh, Saturday Night Live for the first couple of shows. And they tried to do a very adult theme. It didn't go over very well. And then somebody from the Children's Television Network called Jim Henson one day at his New York office and said, we're putting together a children's television show that teaches children not just the ABCs, but about life, languages, social interaction. Would you be interested? Now, everybody knows the story, right? Everybody knows the Sesame Street. You know what his answer was? Not interested. It was a year before he caught on. And he was looking at the rushes one day. They were showing him what they were doing. And he said, you know, I think I want to be involved in this. And so was born Ernie and Bert, Big Bird, and all of the other uh, Muppets that you know of from Sesame Street. The explosion just on the merchandising end is worth literally billions of dollars. Not millions, billions, count them. Um, and that is why Disney now owns them. Because <laughs> the mouse has a lot of money. A lot more than I can even dream of. There we go. Now, Edgar Bergen, the icon of, of all of the uh, uh, other puppeteers and ventriloquists, had two main characters. You met Charlie. And by the way, that was not the original Charlie. I should tell you, that one was built by a friend of mine, Conrad Hartz. He's one of the last basswood carvers in the United States. He actually carves old-fashioned puppets. That was Danny O'Day filling in for Charlie McCarthy today. But uh, Bergen had another puppet, a uh, little on the slow side, and we'd like to introduce you to him in just a moment here. <laughs> yep. Well, Mortimer, here we are. Look at this lovely audience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's some pretty girls in the audience. <laughs> Oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You ain't going to make me kiss them, are you? No, 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 no. You know, there's a very pretty lady right down here, you know, that runs the place. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Charlie told me about her. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Charlie told me I could get a kiss. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll talk about that later, you know. Yeah, I think she's got a crunch on me. A crunch? Yeah, a crunch. Oh, okay. Well, do you have a crunch on him? Yeah. She has a crunch on you. I get a kiss later. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Anyway, uh, Mortimer, uh, I would like you to greet this audience. Uh, you've never met some of these people before. No, I ain't. No, okay. And um, let's start off with a really nice smile. Can we do that? Oh. Yeah, I guess I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I want you to and give it your best effort. Now, beam a smile. No, 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 no. Can you try again? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look out at the audience again. A little more now. Um, little energy. All right, all right. I, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, shucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Mortimer, maybe if you tried this with a little more, a little more um, sex appeal. Oh, Mr. Bergen. Oh, 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 oh. oh, you don't have to be shy about that. It's the 21st century now, you know. It is. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Now, Mortimer, um, I understand that recently, uh, you uh, you moved to your grandpa's farm, is that correct? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Living with grandpa, out on the farm, yeah, yeah, out on the farm. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, you moved from your parents' house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess your parents are no longer around. No, no, no. But now is your mother, is, is your mother still living? Uh, no. Not yet. Uh, not yet. It, no, 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 no. Now, Mortimer. Uh, you're living with Grandpa, yes, yes. And, and you're living out on the farm. Oh. And the farm is out uh, near East Troy, as I recall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'd love to come out to the farm and, and visit with you and Grandpa at some point. Oh, yeah, we'd love to have you, you know. Yeah, we would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd love to be there. See all the cows and the pigs and, and the farm with all the hay smell. And I understand you've got the pond out back. Oh, yeah, yeah, we go swimming. Yeah. Skinny dipping. Oh, well, good. Uh, I'll bring my trunks, trust me. But um, I don't know how to get out there. Oh, you don't? No, no, I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, so I'm going to need the directions. Yeah, directions, yeah, directions, yeah. <laughs> uh, directions, yeah. <laughs> Mortimer, yeah. I need the directions. Oh, yeah, 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 the directions, yeah, yeah. Directions, yeah. <laughs> Phil, Mortimer, I, I'm going to need you to give me the directions so that I can get out to the farm. Oh, yeah. Oh, shucks. Why didn't you say so? I, I did. Mortimer, the directions to the farm, please. I live in Burlington, and I've got to go out to East Troy, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, how do I get out there? Well, let's see now. First, uh, you got to go uh, west on uh, Highway 11. Okay, about uh, how far? Oh, uh, about 10 miles. Okay, and, and now what? Well, then you're going to go to Highway 120, and you're going to turn right. Highway 120, right. I've got it, okay? And what next? Oh, well, you're going to head towards uh, East Troy. It's about five miles. Okay, all right. And then what? You know, you, you know the underpass there? Oh, you mean um, um, uh, Highway 43? Yes, I, I know where that's at. Well, when you get there, yeah. Do a U-turn. <laughs> a U-turn? Well, now, why would I do a U-turn? Well, because you're going the wrong way. No. <laughs> Mortimer. This has got to be the dopiest conversation I've had with you all week. How, young man, just how can you be so stupid? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I got a fella helping me. <laughs> Mortimer's nerd, everybody. <laughs> Have to put on his little headlock thing, otherwise his head falls off. That's not good. Oh, you okay there, Morty? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to go take a nap now. Oh, okay. Whew. Is it warm in here or just me? Oh, a little more water. Bill and Cora Baird have the most beautiful puppets you have ever seen. If you get a chance, go online, look up Baird, B-A-I-R-D. Uh, you are going to see a wealth of colorful puppets Everything from strippers, Bubbles LaRue, uh, who literally took her clothes off, 
Uh, she's the 1930s puppet. Uh, you will see Peter and the Wolf. You'll see a lot of the production they did for television. And uh, there are places uh, that you can even see how they set up their stages. Now, later today, if you want to talk to me after the, after the program, I've got a book by uh, Bill Baird. I'm called The Art of the Puppet, and I can actually show you how the stage setup is and some of those wonderful puppets. So feel free to come and ask. Uh, we'll do that after the show. And of course, all of these puppeteers did things that will bring us now into the 21st century. And of course, we had to have Duck Dodgers here. And really just an excuse for me, because I like Daffy Duck. <laughs> At Duck Dodgers in the 25th century. And you know, Daffy Duck has a very strange voice, and I do voices because I'm a character man. <laughs> so I have to say, you're despicable. <laughs> Just had to throw that in there. Whoop, I made the thing pop up there. There we go. Let's talk about Brian Hansen for a moment. Jim and Jane had children, and Brian Hansen, after his father died in 1990, sadly, uh, from pneumonia, he was working too hard, didn't know he was sick, and died. Uh, his son has taken over, and they are involved in television, film, web productions. They work hand in hand with Disney. They just came out with that new Muppet movie. Uh, it's going gangbusters already. I will own it soon. <laughs> I have to have the DVD. I own all their movies. Um, again, another reason why I don't have a lot of dates. Yeah. What are we going to watch at your house tonight in romance? Puppets. <laughs> Yeah. I think I need to change a few things, don't you? Yeah. I'll never change. <laughs> so Brian Hansen, along with uh, Disney, have put together a number of really great television shows, have won Peabody Awards. They've won all sorts of Emmys. Uh, one of the best known is The Bear in the Blue House. The bear himself stands almost eight feet tall. He operates the same way that Big Bird does. Guy standing inside on stilts. He's got blocks on his shoes, like this, with a TV camera, in a hot fur suit. <laughs> There's a job I don't want in Wisconsin. <laughs> no. I went to uh, Valley Fair uh, theme park last year, and they had these people walking around in suits like this in 90 degree heat. Not a job for a real person, I'm sorry. And they're paying these guys minimum wage. No, <laughs> never. At any rate, uh, these puppets are now using CGI technology behind them. Their sets are done, for the most part, in the, in the background. It, it's all digital. Computers. So a lot of what you see doesn't even exist. Just the puppets. How many people know who Jeff Dunham is? Anybody know? OK, so quite a few people here. Jeff Dunham is the new vanguard in ventriloquism. And he's married character and puppetry and ventriloquism and made a whole new thing. He is the first ventriloquist ever in the world to work in stadiums and concert halls. It's nothing for him to have 20,000 people watching him at a time in one space. I've met him on a few occasions. He's looked at a few of my puppets. He's a really nice guy. Funny, and he will tell you, the first thing that you have to know about puppetry and ventriloquism is you better have a sense of humor, because people know you play with dolls. <laughs> and it's true. I think my favorite character is the one he's got right there, Walter. Now here's a guy that's dressed to kill. He's got the sweater vest on, looks a little like Rick Santorum. He's got the, he's got the little sweater on, got the arms folded, and he got a voice like this. He says, ah, shut the hell up. <laughs> he's not in a good mood ever. And his whole character is about being in a bad mood. And then he's got Peanut the Woozle. If you've seen him, he's a little pink Martian. And he's not breathing pure air because he's out to lunch. He talks a million miles an hour like this, and he did. Jeff, what? I wasn't talking to you. Hey! And he runs all over the stage, and he suddenly eats his face, and it just, it's insane. And he's taken uh, puppetry and, and character and, and put these guys in this little tiny space on stage, and the whole world watches, and they buy his DVDs, and they have them on TV, and they've got, had them in films, and there's another merchandising guy, puppetry, uh, has gotten to the point where it is a billion dollar business. I want part of that. <laughs> Can anybody put me in there, Will? Adopt me. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, uh, Jeff Dunham has really reinvigorated and reignited ventriloquism. There was a period when Paul Winchell stopped performing. 
until about the late 1990s, uh, from about maybe about 1979 or so. There was about a good 10, 15 period, uh, year period where ventriloquism was considered passe. It was considered something third rate. We don't put that on TV. It's all sad. Nobody was coming up with new material. Nobody had puppets that appealed to anyone until Jeff Dunham came along. He showed up on the uh, Johnny Carson show in 1995. And Carson was laughing so hard. This was his first appearance. He had him over to the couch. And at the end of the program, he was saying goodnight to everybody. And he turns to Walter the Grump, and he says, so Walter, uh, we'd like to have you back again sometime. Uh, hopefully you'll be in a better mood. Puppet says, be a cold day in hell for I ever show up in this dump. <laughs> Ad libs like that. That's what you know. Puppets are really great because you can say anything. Now, me, if I said some, you know, something like that to somebody face to face, I'd probably get socked in the in the mug, right? Puppets can get away with murder. They say all sorts of stuff. Uh, one of my favorite jokes is the, is, is the one about the blonde. If you're blind, I'm blind too, so don't take offense. My favorite joke is, is the ventriloquist on stage, and he's working with his puppet, and he's telling blonde jokes and he's insulting all these lovely women in the audience. And finally, one blonde stands up and she says, "I've had enough." No more. You aren't going to make those insults about blinds anymore. You've got it all wrong. And the ventriloquist stands up. He says, ma'am, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. She said, shut up. I'm talking to the little guy on your knee. <laughs> yeah. And what that is about, of course, is suspending belief. One of the things that puppets help us do is suspend belief. Now, when these guys are up here, I'm not the greatest ventriloquist in the world, but you want to watch the puppet. You're drawn in. Why? Because... Even though we may be grown-ups, we never grow up. We want to believe. The puppet draws you in. When the puppet moves its mouth, you automatically look. People think that you actually throw your voice for ventriloquism. You don't. It's here, and it comes out here. You know, if I don't move my lips, it's coming right out my nose. It's literally nose speaking. And you want to suspend belief and believe that my voice, which is over here, is actually coming out of here. Anybody can learn it, by the way. If you want to take up as a hobby, if you want to do it at your church, if you want to do it for your Kiwanis Club, Optimus Club, any of that kind of stuff, the Lions, you know what? Anybody can do this art. As long as you've got uh, some teeth that you can hide your tongue with, and uh, you've got a properly working tongue, you should be able to do this. Anybody can learn. I'll give you a real simple lesson. Everybody, just kind of touch your teeth together and say the letter A. a. Didn't move your lips, right? Say the letter C. C. No lips moving. D. E. e. How about the letter G for goat? G. OK. You get the idea. But now what happens when you use something called a labial or an explosive, like B? What do you do? Yeah, everyone's going, no, no, no. You have to use something called substitute sounds. The 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 boy played basketball. The boy played basketball. P same thing. Peter Tucker tick the tickle tickle tuckers. <laughs> Try that three times real fast without hurting your tongue. <laughs> we have to do those exercises all the time. But you use substitute sounds, and once you learn how to do that, you can gang those together with words and make ventriloquism happen. There's a lot that has to happen. It doesn't come overnight because you have to learn how to manipulate the puppet. You have to learn to act and think for two. You have to remember a script, which I didn't so well today. And you, you, know, you, have, to, uh, you have to interact and make it seem real. But it starts with the ventriloquial alphabet. For those of you that are interested later on and want to learn, I can talk to you about that up here after the program. Well, can we take back that last slide? I moved it. I'm sorry. There is a new guy. It just uh, showed up on the scene about three or four years ago. His name is Terry Fader. Everybody watch uh, America's Got Talent? Well, four years ago, Terry Fader showed up on the scene, and he did something that no ventriloquist has ever done, and took ventriloquism and puppetry to a whole new level. He walked out on stage, and the first thing that the judges said was, oh, a ventriloquist, no. And then he began to sing without moving his lips. And he had this little raggy puppet that sang exactly like Etta James. Exactly like her. And bowled them over. He went on months later to win America's Got Talent. He won a million dollars. And then the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas hired him for a five-year contract 
for $100 million. Wow. A guy that plays with dolls. <laughs> so anytime that someone says, you do what for a living? I say, I had, the, I had the good fortune of meeting Terry uh, this past summer. He, uh, he invited me and my partner Lauren to uh, go see uh, him in his uh, backstage studio. And he's got kind of a den back there. Puppets all over the place, of course. He's got this huge collection. Nice, nice man. And uh, he was looking over some of my puppets. I brought nine or ten of them for, for him to look at. He's considering some stuff for his show. And uh, he's, he's so incredible. They, they, they put us out in the audience, and there's a good thing because those tickets are not cheap. If you go to Las Vegas, come with a lot of money. Front row seats are $139 a pop. You can get in the nosebleed for about 75 Best show I've ever seen. And I'm not talking about just puppets. The music, he sounds like every artist he does. He does uh, Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra. Uh, he does women. He does Dolly Parton. You swear you're listening to Dolly Parton, Hedda James. Uh, Rock and roll hero, heroes like Elvis, wow. Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses, and every single one of these sounds exactly the same, and he's got these puppets that you swear it's coming out of these puppets, and they're just the most amazing thing you've ever seen. It is hands down the best live show I've ever seen, and if you get a chance, go to Las Vegas just for that show. It is worth every penny. You will sit there for two hours, and your mind will be blown because you've never seen anything like that with a puppet before. So he has brought us into the 21st century and a whole new way to look at performing with puppets. Nobody else ever thought of before. This art form has so many uses. Now some of you have uh, maybe a, a church or a synagogue or, or some other form of, uh, of religious uh, retreat and you might want to teach uh, some gospel truth. There are hundreds and hundreds of gospel puppeteers and ventriloquists in the United States alone. Um, there are very famous ones over in England, in fact. There's a, a noted one, doctor, and I can't think of her name right now, but she is the uh, sister to a very well-known uh, ventriloquist named uh, Valentine Box, and they're both ventriloquists, and, and she does uh, uh, religious programs and he does secular. They're all over the place. Now, I belong to two groups, World Vents uh, and the, uh, I can't think of the name all of a sudden, Puppeteers of America, and uh, within those groups we have a lot of professionals. And uh, many of those professionals are actually gospel people, and they go from church to church and event to event, and they talk about Bible truths or uh, whatever. And uh, they use puppets and ventriloquism, uh, especially when talking to children, because it, it's a way for children to connect. It makes it easier for them to listen. Rather than an adult talking down to them, they've got a puppet on the same level. The same is true in psychiatry and psychology. Psychiatrists took the cue from the educators in, in uh, gospel uh, work, <coughs> excuse me, and they, uh, whoops, and they um, applied this, the same philosophy to working with uh, children who were being affected by uh, mental disease, dysfunctional families, that kind of thing, especially if there was anything really nasty happening in the house and they couldn't talk about it, they'd get them to talk to the puppet. It didn't always have to be ventriloquism. Uh, there are a couple of movies that, that played that up. Uh, I think there's just some slides later on that will show that. Here's some religious puppets made by a company out west that uh, all they do is make biblical style puppets. There was a movie called The Beaver. It just came out, I believe it was last year or the year before, with Mel Gibson. And he played a guy that couldn't communicate with his wife, played by Jodie Foster, so he used the puppet to communicate with. There was also a great movie uh, with uh, Bill Murray uh, a few years ago uh, called What About Bob? And the psychiatrist, played by Richard Dreyfuss, uh, used puppets to talk to his family and they couldn't stand it, drove them nuts. Very funny movie. Uh, and all it was doing, of course, is these two movies were just playing on a theme and kind of making fun of psychiatrists and psychologists. But in fact, it does work. I know a couple of those guys, and they say it works like you wouldn't believe. You'll get kids to talk and break their shell and talk about the things that are hurting them. Wow. It's used in corporate team building. There's a guy out in Milwaukee named Dale Brown. He's very famous. He's a ventriloquist and puppeteer. Uh, he does team building exercises for corporations. He comes to places like this and does talks. Um, and uh, he will talk about uh, all sorts of various uh, aspects of whatever business that they're involved in. He'll come prepared with a, a script all about what they're doing. He'll teach. He'll do some team building, get everybody on the same page. 
And then, of course, there's corporate branding. How many people remember Jimmy Nelson and Danny O'Day from the Texaco Star Hour with Milton Berle years ago, and also uh, the Nestle's Quick commercials? And I know some of you remember that. Farvel the dog. Nestle's makes the very best chocolate. And then his mouth would snap shut. That was Jimmy Nelson. That was one of the big branding things of the early 1960s, and it went on through, uh, I believe, the early 80s. And Jimmy Nelson and his puppets, Danny O'Day and Parfell, uh, sold Nestle products and branded that product. Now you'll see uh, Parfell's picture on a lot of their, uh, on a lot of their products. Uh, here's another example. Here's a dummy being used for Altoids. You'll see these kind of uh, uh, things all over the place. Tarot and cigarettes used to have a dummy with a, with a uh, uh, black eye that they used. I'd rather fight than switch. It's used in public education, of course. Here's one for stop, drop, and roll. Uh, fire engine number one. They've got a whole uh, a lot of Muppet-type puppets. And, of course, crime prevention program. There are a lot of those. Uh, McGruff the dog. Take a bite out of crime. That fella, he's all over the place. Now, this one here is a fella in costume, but uh, they use a, a, a puppet in a lot of their demonstrations, and they go to the school systems, and they talk about uh, crime, uh, uh, bad touches, stealing, uh, don't do drugs, all that kind of stuff. Kind of social awareness. Here's another stop, drop, and roll program. You can see the puppets in the background and the clowns in the front. And they teach the kids how to avoid burning, literally. They teach them how to stop, drop, and roll. And usually the stop, drop, and roll puppet is a uh, Dalmatian puppet. There's one way in the background there someplace. Anti-drug programs. I'm currently working on one myself. I used to be an AODA counselor, believe it or not. That the puppets aren't the only thing I do. I was an intern, and I got this idea a lot of years ago, and only now are we coming to fruition. We're going to take a stereotypical guy from a big city who uh, obviously is not in a good mood and looks like he probably doesn't make real good choices. There are a lot of anti-drug programs out there, and a lot of people use puppets, marionettes, or ventriloquist figures to get across those messages. And again, this is something where the puppet can get away with saying anything, and you can sell the idea. Uh, sometimes it's kind of dry talking about alcohol and drugs. So you bring a puppet in to sell the concepts. It's used in health and science. Here we've got a whole bunch of body parts in a, in a stage show. They're all puppets. Uh, and of course, entertainment anywhere from your living room to Las Vegas. I started out with one of those little guys. I had a little Danny O'Day puppet. I was seven years old. That's when I first got into ventriloquism and puppetry. And that's where most professional ventriloquists start, or vents as we call them in the business. A lot of the professionals that you see out there today, Jeff Dunham, Terry Fader, they all started when they were level, right around seven, eight years old, almost all of us. And we entertained our parents and bored them to death in our living rooms. There's Terry Fader down there in his show in Las Vegas. That's Ron Lucas and Scorch the Dragon and uh, Billy Bob his puppet. And we're going to talk about character real quick before we go on in our Q&A because character is everything. It's all about attitude. And I'm going to be right back because I've got to go get a little fella for out of the back here. Everybody, I'd like you to meet Allie Cat. Oh. Say hi, Al. <laughs> yeah, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a tough kitty cat, you know? Yeah, I'm from New York. I'm just tough, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, you're real tough. Uh, you want to get rid of the cigarette? Why? Oh. Well, you can't smoke in here. It's a public building. Well, I don't care. I want a light. No, no, you can't smoke in here. It's against the law. It's bad for your health. I'm allergic, and I'll bet you a lot of these people here are allergic. So give me that cigarette. <laughs> Will you please let go of the cigarette? No. Okay. You can't light it. I can't. No, you can't light it. It's against the law. There's all sorts of laws against that in Wisconsin, and it's just not good for your health. Besides which, all you're doing is just acting like a tough guy with that thing in there. Well, I am tough. Really? How tough are you? Well, I belong to the mob. The mob? You mean like the mafia? No, the M-O-B. The M-O-B, yeah, the mob, the mafia. No, it's an acronym. An acronym for what? M-O-B? Moist. 
ora the where. <laughs> okay, so you're a real tough guy. Yeah, I'm very, very tough. You see, I got tough guy uh, wristband. I got a tough guy shirt. I got a cigarette. Yeah, I'm very, very tough. You see the black eye? Got that in a fight last week. Yeah, I see that. Uh, who with? A skunk. It was a stinker of the fight. Yeah, okay, real good. So um, you're, you're just this big tough guy and you're putting on this act. You do know that, right? I mean, you're, you're just a pretty kitty. No, I'm not. I'm a tough cat. Look, I can prove that you're not as tough and as rough as you say you are. You can. Yep, I can. How are you going to do that? I'm going to reveal the real you behind the face. Yeah, uh-huh. I'd like to see you try it. <laughs> I'll put one in your kisser. No, you're not going to do that. But I am going to show these people out here that you're not as tough as you think you are. You're not a bully. Yeah, I am. No, you're not. And I can prove it. We're going to wipe away the fantasy. We're going to show who you really are behind that mean face. You are? Yeah. I dare you. OK. <laughs> Now what do you have to say? This is so embarrassing. <laughs> I can't see. Oh, you can't see. Well, you know, we can do something about that. Hang on just a second here. I think we can fix that problem. Oh, that's better. <laughs> say you're not as tough as you thought you were. Oh, talk to the hand. <laughs> So, how do you feel now? Rough and tough. We just revealed the real you. You're obviously not rough and tough. You're, you're a hand. Yeah, I know. But I'm still rough. Really? Well, you don't look tough to me. Well, I am. And I can prove it. How's that? Well, feel my hand. You do realize I'm feeling my own hand. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you just bit your own hand with your own hand. I may be rough and tough, but he's an idiot. <laughs> Look, you're not rough anymore. Yes, I am. You know why? Why? Because I need some Jergens hand lotion. Well, that was supposed to be the big laugh. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is the Muppet-like Muppet uh, uh, puppet. And uh, all this is is a set of eyeballs with a little wire on it. You want to start a puppet at home? Take a couple of ping pong balls, paint some irises on it, stick some wire in it, and you're ready to go. And you can do puppets with the kids. You don't have to go fancy all the time. Yeah, go ahead with Ellie Ken. So let's put this little guy over here. I think he needs his head. <laughs> and this little guy's got, uh, he's got moving eyebrows, all sorts of stuff here. There he goes. You know, just put him over here in his lap. So, he's all about attitude, right? You have to have a little bit of attitude with your puppet. Um, whether it's your hand talking to you or it's one of these little fuzzy guys or one of the dummies. Character, character, character. Attitude is everything because it sells the personality of whether you're working with a string puppet, a hand puppet, or a ventriloquist figure, they all have to come alive. And that, uh, that takes character. Uh, and that also takes manipulation. Now, you'll notice how when I was turning over here, he was moving his head like this and giving you that look like, boy, he's an idiot, right? You have to do little things like that. You have to kind of separate yourself and let the dummy seem to have a separate agenda. Are you still here? Go away. Anyway, and then you have to uh, speak up your big dummy. What that's about is the dummy's got to take control. He's got to be the one in charge, one way or the other, even if he's a dumb, shy puppet. 
They're always in charge. They're the one always stealing the show. And then there's the choice of the voice. That goes to the heart of character probably more than anything else. I use several different voices here today, even with this ridiculous condition I've got today. But, uh, you know, Charlie McCarthy sounds like this. He's got this sort of pinched little boy voice. And then you've got uh, Mortimer Snurr, who's <laughs> just kind of dopey like that, you know. Two completely different characters. One is a brash character, the other one's kind of a dopey guy. Uh, and then, you know, when we had the sock out our, uh, before, he's got kind of a Pat Buttram voice. Yeah, crime and Italy, I sound like this when I talk like Pat Buttram. And then the cat's a big tough guy. Yeah, I'm a tough guy, that's me. You can do that just moving your mouth, or you can try it venture locally. Um, but all of it colors the character. And that's what puppetry has been about since day one, is making people believe that there's something that's not there. Now, why does that remind me of politics? I don't know. <laughs> there goes that congressional thing again. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the, the real heart of any puppet, of any puppet show, of any small enterprise, whether you're a psychiatrist talking to a child, whether you're talking to a television audience, whether it's a dummy, a puppet up here, or puppets on strings, you have to make it seem alive. So the movement and the voice are very, very important. It gives them their own thinking agenda. They have to look like they're thinking. Now clothes will make the man and also make the marionette or the puppet. You'll see all of these puppets up here have their own choices of clothing. Charlie McCarthy, of course, is this brash character who's got a thing for clothes. He's got this finely tailored white, tail and, uh, white tail and ties, uh, excuse me, white tie and tails, and a, and a top hat and a monocle. He's very well put together, and he's very confident, so he dresses confidently. Mortimer Snurd, he's got stuff out of his grandfather's old chest of drawers. You know, he's got that old tweed suit on that doesn't fit quite so well, the old battered straw hat. He's got an old-fashioned rounded stiff collar with a bow tie that doesn't match, and a vest that doesn't match, and of course he's wearing his work boots. He's a little slower, doesn't really care about aesthetics. Uh, Chico the cabbie, He's dressed a little on the top side. You know, he's got the, he's got the little gloves with the studs on him and stuff. The same thing with the cat. They're kind of tough guy characters. And uh, you'll see some of these fellows over here, they've just got suits. Um, we've gotten away from that. You know, we don't have too many of the tuxedoed characters anymore and just guys in little suits. The costume has to be like theater. It's got to fit the character. So if you get into puppetry, you get into ventriloquism, think clothing. But start cheap. Go to a rummage sale. Buy children's 3T uh, clothes, little toddler clothes, for 50 cents. That's a great way to start. And later on, you can worry about spending the money on this stuff. OK, we're going to move on to the Q&A here, because I'm running uh, over time. And uh, we're going to uh, entertain any questions that you might have. Now again, I'm deaf in this ear. More than half deaf in this ear, and I've got a cold. So I may have trouble hearing you, so I'm going to probably have to run. I'm going to drive the poor camera guy nuts, because you have to follow me around the room. So does anyone have any questions? Everyone looks like they want to leave. <laughs> There's a question down there. Uh, let me get down there for you. With Avenue Q, did you work with the cast of Avenue Q? No, I didn't. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, I have seen the show, and it, it's a wonderful show. It, it's, uh, it's definitely for adults, and it's uh, a lot of social issues. And they really took the Muppets of Sesame Street and, and made them grow up for an R-rated audience, and it's just very funny. But uh, these guys are using puppets on stage. You see the puppeteer. And it's amazing. They're talking, they're moving their lips, and you never pay attention to the puppeteer because the puppet skills are so good. You're watching the puppets the entire time. Same thing they did with uh, The Lion King. When they did that on a stage and they had all the giant puppets and the, uh, uh, the giant giraffes and the elephants and everything, you could see the performers. But you watched the puppets. And that was about color, costume, character, and in some cases, voice. Now, if anybody would like to look at some of the memorabilia and stuff and talk to me uh, after we're done, Feel free to come on over. I'll be more than happy to answer questions. Uh, any other questions from the, from the peanut gallery here? You really think anybody can do it? OK, if you want to ask me questions, oh, down here. Ah. I just said, you really think that anybody can learn it? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I, I think that's impossible. <laughs> if it's not. If really? you, can, you can speak normally this way. You can speak without moving your lips. Just, just barely touch your teeth together, separate your lips, and, and try the alphabet. A. C, D, try all the easy letters first. There are lots of books on this subject to teach you how to do it. Any other questions? Yeah, we're sorry we, we ran over there. I didn't think we were going to go quite that far over. 
so hopefully everyone got their lunch and aren't late for going back for work or anything. But if you have any other questions you want to ask me privately up here, great. I'll be here for a few minutes yet as we're packing up. Thanks, everybody, for coming today. Thank Thanks for coming to the JPAC. Loved uh, seeing everybody. Hope to see you again. And start playing with puppets. Trust me, you'll get a lot out of it.